If I didn't, I wouldn't be a member of it. And I thank God for what it's doing. And I thank God that it doesn't stand still. It's going forward all the time. And so it's a real joy to be here tonight. And I want you to pray as I speak that God will use His Word to convict hearts and draw souls to Christ. I know you want to see souls saved, and so do I. And that's what we're here for tonight. So you pray. And after I pray, I'm going to tell you why I'm delivering the sermon that I am tonight. The subject is not new, and the sermon will not be new, but it has burned its way into my heart in a new way and a much more forceful way than it has ever the 38 years that I've been preaching. And I've preached on the subject that I'm using tonight many times. But if I can get across to you what God has gotten across to me in preparing this sermon, then I feel that some of you may go away from here tonight with a deeper determination to win some of your loved ones and neighbors and friends to Christ, some of them that are lost, you'll win them to Christ. Will you bow your heads just a moment, please? Our Father, we thank Thee for the privilege of prayer. We thank Thee, our Father, that we can call upon Thy name. In the name of Jesus, we are invited to call upon Thy name, and we are invited to make our desires and our needs known to Thee. And so, Father, tonight, I need Thee every hour, I need Thee every moment of every hour, but this is the hour that I need thee most this day, now. Because if this message is my message, then, Father, there'll be no message. But if it's God's message, then someone will be moved. Someone will be convicted. Someone will be drawn to God. And so I commit soul, spirit, and body to thee. And I pray, God, that you'll take this voice and this heart of mine. And I pray that you'll speak to these dear people. And those, I don't know who they are. I do not know how many. I cannot see the heart. But Father, you see the heart. And I pray that every person in this building tonight who is not born again will be convicted deeply and drawn mightily and saved by God's grace before this service comes to a close. We thank thee for this church. And Father, I do not pray hypocritically when I say I thank God for this church, for the mission program, for the children's home, for the school, for the pastor that you've used here in such a special way. God bless this pastor. Give him wisdom. Give him strength. He needs today in this hour a double portion of wisdom and grace and strength and courage, Father. So you equip him for the days ahead and bless those who work with him. In Jesus' name we ask it. Now, Father... I commit the remaining moments of this service to thee. May thy will be done, and God shall have the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm speaking tonight on hell. Now, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm using the subject hell. A few weeks ago, one of my dear friends who lives in another city, in fact, he lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, called me on the phone. In fact, the phone rang. And I don't usually begin a sermon this way, but I want to tell you why I'm preaching on hell tonight. I want to tell you what the Lord used to impress me to use the subject that I'm using tonight. And this, the phone rang, I picked it up. And at first I thought it was some, uh, somebody uh, calling a quack call or somebody to maybe threaten me or something. Because all I could hear was a groan. Just a muffled groan. I couldn't understand what was being said. And then I said, who is this? And finally, I understood his name. And I said, what's wrong? What in the world's wrong? And he said, I've just gotten a message from my son that my little granddaughter was playing with some other children in the yard. And the neighbor was burning trash it was in the early fall and leaves were piled high and uh, other uh, limbs and, and things, they'd piled up and they'd set on fire and they were burning trash. And this man said, uh, my little granddaughter was out there and a little boy pushed her into the fire. And that's the last thing he said. He absolutely could not speak. He was so grieved and so heavy 
and so burdened and so broken, he couldn't speak. And then in a few minutes, the phone rang again, and he called back, and he said, pray. And that's all he said, hung up. Now, here is the thing that gripped me. Here is the thing that gripped me as I've never been gripped about hell and the people who are in hell right now. There was a man. His granddaughter, his little granddaughter, about I think maybe six, five or six years old, had been pushed in the fire. She was not dead. He did not know how badly she was burned. But he was so terrified and so broken until it absolutely took away his voice and he couldn't talk. He couldn't tell me what he wanted to tell me. And then the next day he called back and explained to me that at that time she was in the emergency room. He did not know the extent of the burns. It was very serious and she'll be scarred very badly and she's still being treated. But I'm saying to you that if a little child being pushed into a fire could cause a man to lose his speech and be burdened and broken to that extent, my God, shouldn't we be concerned about the thousands in Greenville that are going to hell? I'm going to tell you something, friend, and you may not agree with me. We don't believe in a Bible hell like we ought to believe in it. If we did, we'd spend more time trying to get people ready to stay out of hell. And I'm going to tell you tonight, as I studied and I did study and I spent hours studying. I've been preaching 38 years, but it takes me longer, much longer, to get up a sermon now than it did 37 years ago. All I had to do then is read a verse of scripture and preach two hours. Now it takes me two weeks to get up one sermon. And I'm not joking, I'm not, I'm not just saying that. Because the more you study this Bible, the more you'll see that you need to study it to really understand what God's saying to you. Now, here's the reason that I have been gripped. And since that call came, I don't know why. I really don't know why it got a hold of me like it did. Because my, I don't, I've never had a loved one burned. I, I saw a man in the hospital in Salisbury, North Carolina, when I was there in the tent. He was drunk, he gave out a gas, he got a five gallon can of gas, he poured gas in the tank, he was drunk, he poured it all over himself, he spilled it all over his clothes, and he got a little in the tank, a lot on the ground, a lot on his clothes, and then the poor drunk sat the can down and struck a match to light a cigarette. And I saw him in the Salisbury Hospital, and I saw the nurse raise up the sheet. You're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you, because I'm going to tell you something worse than this before I'm through. She raised up the sheet and let me see the maggots eating his legs where they were burned. Now, let me tell you something, friend. I believe in a literal burning Bible hell just as strongly as I believe in a beautiful heaven. And souls are in hell now burning now. All right. We should read a little text, I suppose. And I'll read some scripture. It's very familiar. Preached by the greatest preacher that ever preached. The hottest sermon on hell you'll ever read the clearest sermon on hell you'll ever hear. And these, these words fell from the lips of the Lamb of God. And here's what he said in Mark 9, 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life main than having two hands be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where thy worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life main than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their sore worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, 
It is better for the inner light, enter the kingdom of God, rather, with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, I don't know any better scripture to read as a foundation, as a text for a sermon on hell. I don't know any better. In fact, I don't think there is any better in the Bible. Now, with that in mind, with that in mind, I want to answer some sensible, timely questions about hell and what the Bible tells us about hell and why I believe that you and why I believe that I should be more concerned about the people who are not ready to die and who are not prepared to meet God and who will not stay out of hell unless we get them saved through the gospel. You can't go to heaven unless you're born again. In this year, 1974, and it's almost 75 now, but in this modern streamlined atomic age, you must be born again if you hope to escape the damnation of hell. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to make a few brief statements, and I'll spend most of my time on the last part of my sermon. But a few brief statements, questions and answers like this. Was there a time when there was no hell? According to the Bible, there was. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's Genesis 1-1, and there's not a word, not one word, not one suggestion of hell there. In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular, and the earth, singular. And there's not a word about hell. You get this in your mind and you keep this in your mind. God Almighty has never created anything and never will create anything just for the joy of creating. God creates for a purpose. He's all wise. And God hasn't made anything he doesn't need. And God's not going to make anything he doesn't need. And there's no surplus of anything if we take care of it as God would have us take care of it. And if we'd had a Joseph on the scene, you wouldn't be paying two dollars and a half and three dollars a pound for beef and a dollar a pound for fat back now if we'd had somebody with some sense in Washington. Say amen or drop dead. Don't make any difference to me. Either one. You say, you must be a Democrat. No, I'm Baptist. I thought the pastor told you that. I belong here. We need somebody in, in, in this country. We need some men in Washington. We need some men in Columbia with some good common sense.